Hey, this is Pastor Nick Gillespie from the Grace Baptist Church. Thank you for tuning in to our channel and watching this sermon. I hope this sermon that comes up is a blessing and an encouragement to you. If you ever see fit to come join us, we're at 344 8th Street at the corner of Vacancy, downtown Springfield. We'd love to see you. I have another message for you right at the end. Stick around. All right. I want to talk to you about this today. <clears throat> Has Christianity, has Christianity gone completely mad? Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and so some of the things I'm going to say today, I'm going to be sarcastic. I am not being sarcastic towards you. Uh, but uh, start in Matthew chapter 24. Let's like read verses 36 through 40. And uh, all right. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day that, the, that Noah entered into the ark. And, uh, and by the way, that's Jesus endorsing that there was a flood. So to tell somebody there was no flood, you know, that's, just, that's hyperbole. That's not hyperbole isn't the right word. Uh, uh, you know, ah. It's just Fake a story. News. What? Fake news. And <laughs> Jesus endorsed it. So telling people things like, well, you can believe in Jesus, but you don't have to believe in that. You have a real problem here. Because all of a sudden, Jesus out of his mouth talks about it. But anyways, that's not the sermon. And do not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of uh, son Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Father, again, we are thankful for our time to meet this morning. And uh, we're thankful for our uh, church, our time to our time to do this. Lord, pray you'd uh, give us a clear mind, a clear heart, help us to say what needs to be said. And, uh, and again, we're thankful. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Like I said, it's been an interesting few weeks. I don't follow my, hardly any local politics. Um, and when I say that, that disappoints you. I pray for our politicians. Uh, you know, our mayor, our city, our, our city manager, assistant city manager, and our uh, five um, city council uh, members, our five county commissioners, uh, our president, our vice president, and our president's cabinet. Now, like president's cabinet, I don't go through the whole name and everyone. I was just pretty much praying in general because by that time, you know, Got mad. So, <clears throat> not got mad. But so when I say that though, I don't, I try to stay out of politics and I don't know much of what's going on specifically. Now, it doesn't mean, I, I know slightly more about national, but not much. But it's a balance between being slightly aware and distanced enough to keep my sanity. Um, you know, the ignorance of how a bill is passed, even for people in the government. You know, I've learned things in my civics classes from Mr. Romer and Model UN and those things and how to pass a bill. And to hear the very people of Congress talking about how to get a bill passed and, you know, and how things, some things are unconstitutional. Just because you don't like something doesn't make it unconstitutional. You know that, right? But, you know, that's why it's the Constitution. And it's not based on feelings. But so I try to keep my sanity because, you know what, I have one vote. I'm going to exercise it, I'm going to use it, and I'm praying for them. So, you know, just leave me alone. Don't come up afterwards and say, you know, you need to be more involved. I don't need to be more involved in politics. You may, and uh, I'm fine with that. <clears throat> but I was slightly aware of some happenings the last few weeks, but I didn't think much of them, nor did I bring them up to the pulpit, and because uh, I didn't think they were an issue, and I don't think actually with our church they were an issue. Um, you know, you, none of you asked. Not one person asked about this, and I'm, I'm kind of glad you did. I'd be fine if you did, if you said, hey, what do you think about what's going on? But So none of my sarcasm today is aimed at you as a church. But the amount of crazy that's going on the last couple weeks, let's go ahead and just bring an illustration here. Let's, sit, you know, let's, let's start off getting everybody offended. Go ahead and bring it up, Clay. This is me right now. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. And uh, if that offends you, uh, well, here we go. But I really feel like I'm taking crazy pills with all everything going on. And uh, so you can go and get off that. Matt roped me into another project in the last couple weeks, and we're driving over to Home Depot uh, to rent a 
mulcher and uh, trying to you know take care of all the wood and stuff out there. And in passing, he said, "Well, there was less people at the gym last on the on the day of the eclipse." He was like, "It was great. I had the whole place to myself, and uh, and uh, and I had seen videos of people talking about it. I'm like, well, why would that stop me from going to the gym?" He's like, "People are bent out of shape over this, like over an eclipse." Yeah, I'm like enough not to go to the gym. It's like yes, like no way. Yeah, and, and so it was back and forth. I already knew some people were bent out of shape over it, and I thought about maybe just making a joke out of it from the pulpit, but I didn't. I was like, you know, it's not even a thought in my mind. However, we're gonna have to talk about some of these. Show me the first slide here, Clay. God's urgent warning to America. 2024 solar eclipse prophecy revealed. I took that screen grab yesterday. Looking kind of silly now, aren't they? Yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. And I'm not going to make you watch that video. This, you've seen this one? Oh, yeah. So the eclipse passed through Jonah, Texas, Nineveh, Texas, Rapture, Indiana, Nineveh, Indiana, Nineveh, Ohio, Nineveh, PA, Nineveh, New York, Nineveh, Nova Scotia, and crossed over the ark in William, Williamston, Kentucky. You see that one line, the total, <clears throat> total solar eclipse will take, be take place in April 8th this year, will pass through Jonah. <clears throat> you know when the Bible talks about, when Jesus talks about you're going to see signs in heaven, it's going to be more than this, right? It's not something that, you know, it's going to pass through certain towns in America. When it's talking about those... So I get on myself. Next slide. <clears throat> God marked the spot. You know, you think you'd go behind yeah. your stuff and you would delete this stuff. But, you know, there you have the, the eclipse from uh, last year and then the eclipse from this year. And it's right over... Somewhere in Texas, Careville, Texas, and uh, so it's the same latitude as Israel. So therefore, it must be end times. It kind of reminds me of you know several years ago there was three Jewish festivals in three months of row, and they were all on new moons. <laughs> Remember people throwing a fit about that? You already know where I'm going. They're all on new moons. That's how the Jews work. You know, these people are getting, they, they, somebody just noticed it. Blow everything up. <laughs> all right, let's hit the fourth slide. Rapture believer demands return of $1,000 in tips at Florida Taco Restaurant. <laughs> Imagine going back. Now, what this lady's claiming is they, they, fraud, they committed fraud with the tip. And uh, so a woman who left over $1,000 in tips at a Florida taco restaurant because, uh, but anyway, she thought the rapture was going to happen. So then she's going back with regret. I need my money back. And uh, of course, she's getting just roasted everywhere. And so she's like, no, they must have changed it. You can't change tips anymore. Right? No, I'm not sure you ever could. You know, you provide the receipt. It says it. Or you tap it on the screen and you write it. And she did it twice. So it's not like, you know, somebody did the same exact same thing to this person. But there you go. It, it, it's just it's just craziness. Now, you can go ahead and go to black screen. I've made the joke before. When the rapture hits, you know, it'll be pretty cool, you know. The, our homeless problem in America is going to be fixed. Because you know what? They can have my house. I won't be using it. But you know what? I don't know when that's going to be, so I'm not giving it up. Man, I'm getting, see, I don't want to get out of myself all this stuff. The rapture is a signless event. But then you're, you know, somebody's out there saying, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Man, I saw somebody's eyes light up recently. They they, they oh, I got you on this one. The rapture's not in the Bible. And I said, well, the word Bible's not in the Bible either, but you're using it. <laughs> Neither is Trinity, by the way. You know the word Trinity is not in the Bible? Therefore, there must not be a Trinity. Just because the word rapture isn't used doesn't mean it's not there. It's all over scripture, but the word isn't. Anyways, along all of those, so I taught, let's see, in September of 2022, I brought a Bible study to this pulpit thinking that everybody had heard what I was talking about when I talked about red heifers. Now, I think most of you have heard, the red, heard of the red heifers. Still, 
Craig knows about the red heifers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Jews uh, used that for a uh, sacrifice. There you go. But anyways, it's it's the big thing. You know, it's the big thing among Christian circles. Apparently all your social media is on, you know, friends and the office and everything else. Mine's over spiritual things, Angela. Because that's really spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Mother's Day sermon just got ten times worse. <laughs> ten times worse. Let's think about this for a minute. Do you really think Jesus is in heaven anxiously awaiting four heifers to get to Israel to be sacrificed? I can't wait to get back. I mean, but these four heifers have to be sacrificed first. Is that really what you think? <laughs> How? Okay. Ask nine. I don't have Kathy here to double check my language. And uh, we'll go with ask nine. I was about to say stupid. But uh, we'll, we'll just go with that. You know. We're going to get to more times. Anyways, but I taught on this on a Wednesday in September of 22. And uh, so here's a slide of my conclusion that I gave on the red heifers. And I'll read it to you. This is my last line of notes from September of 22. Absolutely nothing will come of this. And Christianity, religion will be mocked. Rightfully so again. Yep. So let's answer the question. What is the significance of a red heifer in Israel? To Christians, absolutely none. To the world, it could be significant. Who knows? Anyways. By the way, it's a bad understanding of end times. We'll cover that in a minute, too. Do I need to talk about Mark Driscoll? Does anybody even know about Mark Driscoll? Do you know about the male stripper at the, male co uh, at the Stronger Men Conference? All right. So I was kind of prepared for this. Our church doesn't know who Mark Driscoll is, and that makes me so happy. Um... We don't know who the other guy is. I don't remember his name. Now, I know some of you are going to, and I get that. But uh, just that, you know, we aren't having a bunch of weird influences. This guy had a former male stripper, not Driscoll. Driscoll actually called this out. Had a former male stripper come out at the beginning of the, the Stronger Man Conference and did a demonstration with a pole. Now, let's go ahead and pull up the pictures. Why do we need to see this? Uh, it's not too pro pro provocative there. But, so, he, you know, if he left a shirt... Now, by the way, for me, if you have a guy at a men's conference open it up by showing feats of strength, and, he, and part of it is a pole. Yeah, but in this context, we have a problem with that. I think most people do, but however... The guy swallowed his sword, climbed up the pole, slid all the way down it with the sword down his throat, and then stopped right before the ground. It, I mean, it, was, it takes a lot of strength. You can go ahead and go blank screen on that. Too bad he didn't start falling. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, I'm trying to be nice, Ron. <laughs> so this guy, Mark Driscoll, comes out and just eviscerates the whole thing. And in, in this very conference, he talked about how out of line it was. And uh, it just kind of went off. And then the pastor that was running the whole thing from the front row, right about 10 minutes in, you're out of line, Mark. You hear him yell it. You're done, Mark. And so this guy, Mark, put his baseball cap back on and walked off the stage. Social media blows up over it. However, they come back out and discuss it. The, the, the other pastor comes up, talks about Matthew chapter 18. You know, you should come to me first. Well, that's not what Matthew chapter 18 is talking about. You know, if we as a church do something out in the open, then Matthew chapter 18 does not protect us. And that's what a lot of cult leaders try to do. They use Matthew chapter 18 to protect themselves. You know, if we do something like that, you have every right to come out and just criticize us however you want, right? But now if I do something you personally, Matthew chapter 18 comes into play. And uh, so later on in the conference, they sit down, chit chat, and they work it all out. And I'm just wondering, is this whole thing contrived? Is this because social media blew up? Isn't that what you kind of want? And I haven't figured that out yet. But watching the pictures, just what I couldn't stand is the pandering. Motorcycles on the screen projecting some sort of weird toughness. And it appeals to people, I guess. I just don't get it. And the Bible talks about becoming all things to all people. And I'm for that, by the way. Not being sinful. But becoming all things to all people. And, uh, and I think there are times I need to be better at that. 
and uh, you know there are you know other people that are better at than I am, but I you know I tend to be no, let's just do it. But then I read the comments of people who were actually there, and and if you use this phrase, I'm not. But they said I was there, and afterwards Jesus was lifted up. How do you do that? <laughs> Do you know when the Bible, when the Bible talks about, I shall be, if I be lifted up, you know what it's talking about? Crucifixion. Talking about crucifixion. It is not talking about, you know, let Jesus be lifted up in our service today. I know what somebody's trying to say. You're just not really saying what you think you are. It's kind of like those people that say, well, I, you know, we want to be baptized in, in this, both in the sp spirit, we want to be baptized with fire. I mean, you guys know that's talking about hell, right? I, I, I mean, read the context. That's what I was talking about. Let's move on. So now Israel gets bombed, and now we are really going crazy. Now you all, Angela, did you hear Israel got bombed? Okay, so we can talk about that. <laughs> so Israel gets attacked, and all of a sudden now we're in World War Three, and then we're in times again. Does the Bible teach us? Now, with this next thing, I am absolutely not belittling war. But this is how we're reacting to stuff like this. Go ahead and throw it up there. Oh, oh okay. This one's first. Voters, fear for World War III as Iran strikes Israel will weigh foreign policy in 2024. You should have been weighing foreign policy the entire time. But instead, we as a country are more focused. I had a little... I'm not... I don't particularly even call myself a Republican. I, I, I'm conservative. You know, but I helped two of my kids do their taxes the other day. And even I am just frustrated for them and how much they paid in taxes compared to what they made. Like, that's not right. It's like we're trying to build. You know, it, oh. it, and so then I, I use this as a time to lecture. Because, you know, growing up, I haven't been very good. I was never good at lecturing my kids. But I use this. And I said, you see this. You see the extra tax. You see all the fees. You see all this stuff going up. You see the bills coming through, the measures coming up. And then you vote yes for that? Well, we rent. So, therefore, our rent won't go up when levies go up. And I had to explain that. Yes, your rent will go up if levies go. Because if they start charging me a certain amount and I own your home, and then all of a sudden I'm going to raise your rent by that amount. And, uh, you know, and so we're so concerned in this country right now about gay rights, abortion rights, and we should be, by the way. But then all of a sudden people are fighting for gay rights and abortion rights, and that's what they vote on instead of seeing the whole thing, this whole country also is a business. You know, me hitting a budget. You know, we're so... You know, people want to... People are going to be able to sacrifice for unborn. Now, hopefully, we come to a place where we can stop that. But do you know voting for a Republican candidate isn't going to stop that? You know that, right? And if it's going to stop, voting for a Democrat isn't going to stop it or make it keep on going either. Yeah. Donald Trump, Joe Biden are not saviors of any sort. But and what we do, what we do is we focus so high on elections, we don't look at low elections, where all these little tax. When's the last time you opened up your your phone bill, your your other bills, and look at all the taxes? And how you think you're in a tax bracket that's only paying 15, 20, 30 percent, whatever tax bracket you're in? But then when you look at all your taxes, no, <laughs> you're paying a lot more than that because it's all these little things. Because we only focus on the net, net federal elections. We don't focus on the little. But anyways, so a little warning for the next slide. I'm not belittling war at all, but this slide encapsulates something right here. Go ahead and hit it, Clay. People in the Middle East is unstable for the 3,450th year in a row. We care about the Middle East. We care about war, but, you know, let's not get crazy here. I'm going to make a statement. And I hope it shocks you a little bit, and then I'm going to back it off a little bit later. I'd vote for the Antichrist if I knew who he was. He's a loser. He will lose. And if once the Antichrist is in power, we're that much closer to being with Jesus, and I'm okay with that. I hope that got you a little stirred up because I'm about to about to about to spin it on you. All 
All right, so I have five points. We're gonna hit the house sometime today. But the first one is this, you got your pen ready? Number one, calm down. <sighs> calm down. If you're bent out of shape by my antichrist voting comment, and this is something I wrote, wrote word for word, this point is aimed at you, calm down. It's impossible as we don't know who the antichrist is until after the rapture. So it's not like this guy's walking around with a, with a tag that says, I'm, hi, I'm the antichrist. The man of sin will be revealed. It means we'll know who he is, but we don't know what he is. You catch that, right? So I can't vote for him anyways. So again, calm down. And my one vote, that shouldn't bother you. See, Jesus in context of his ascension and return said, let not your heart be troubled. Calm down. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 18, in context of end times, Paul wrote this, wherefore comfort one another with these words, calm down. Are you anxious about end times? Calm down. And I know the words calm down don't work in context. Like if, you know, Lisa's freaking out about something, look at her and say, calm down, doesn't work. That's not what we're doing here. I know that, you know, there's anxiety. I know that, you know, things go on in our lives, that we have anxiety. I'm not telling that to calm down. Just don't, don't let this pile on. You're anxious about the red heifers, or maybe you don't even know about it until today. Calm down. But I don't know what's going to happen. All right, quick, quick poll. Raise your hand if you know what's going to happen. So why be anxious about it? All right, so that's number one. Calm down. Number two, peace comes from knowing the truth. But we don't know all of it. That's fine. I had a conversation several months ago with somebody, and they said they were struggling with something. You know, and by the way, you shouldn't just settle the truth in your life. Salvation's by grace. You know, we get baptized afterwards. Church, church attendance is important. There's just some things that ought to be settled. The Bible's the word of God. Eternal security. Just let those things be settled. Don't read. You know, we talk about reconstruction, and the problem with some reconstruction is it goes too far. You know, lay a foundation. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Trinity is real. Salvation is by grace. You know, and then everything above that, you know, that you know, maybe isn't as important, we can look at. But don't take down that foundation. So if you're struggling, don't spread your struggle to people who can't handle it. I talked to somebody at this conversation I had months ago. Somebody was struggling with Calvinism. Long time Christian. I'm struggling with Calvinism. And uh, if somebody ever asked me what, I, I've been combating Calvinism for 30 years. You know, the first time I heard about that, that's goofy. You know, how, how many, you've ever heard that? What, how many point Calvinists are? Because there's five points. Tulip, uh, total privacy, unlimited, something, limited atonement, something, and preservation of the saints. Oh, how many points Calvinists are you? One, preservation of the saints. That's it. The rest of it, you know, which by the way, there's a little bit of truth in each one. And uh, don't go home and start studying Calvinism. Otherwise, you will start struggling. You'll start, well, what does this mean? What does predestination mean? And you will start <laughs> doing that. So what you don't do is you don't struggle, take your struggle and pass it on to somebody else. If you're struggling, don't pass your struggle on to people who can't handle it and don't need it. Now, if I have doubts about something, who do I take it to? For me, salvation couldn't mean a doubt a long time ago. You know, for me, doubt might be, you know, how, uh, you know, Jehoiachin. And uh, so he was 18 at one, eight, you know, eight in the other. Or the Zerubbabel thing. There's still a little bit of struggle on that. But, you know, I'm trying to figure out why the names listed are in a different place or different than another. And I just don't know. The Bible's the word of God. I'm not worried about it. But you know what I don't do? I don't go, you know, Clay, sir, to use you on this. I don't go over to Clay and say, you know what? I can't figure this out in the Bible. I'm having doubts about this. What's that going to do to Clay? Well, now I, now I have doubts. Well, if he has doubts, now I have doubts. What it? But I had this conversation with somebody several months ago. I'm just struggling predestination. Maybe some people are chosen. Some people aren't. 
which flies in the face of Scripture. Then someone else about a month ago that knows them, you know, I'm kind of struggling with, with Calvinism. Why are you talking about your doubts? Now, don't get me wrong. There's people you should talk to about your doubts. But, you know, you don't pass them on to somebody who can't handle it. And it was in the back of my mind. It's like, ah, I see now. Somebody's in the background talking about this because they can't figure it out. But we, I used to, we used to have somebody in this church that did it all the time. Every time there was an outing or something, you know, this person would pick out somebody, and not on purpose. I don't think she did it on purpose. Would pick out somebody. What do you think about this teaching? It's something that, like maybe, you know, had been taught by, you know, Lisa, Brandon, or Becca, or something like that. And then would say, well, what do you think about this? And sowing discord. Now, not meaning to, but she did. And it hurt people. But however, the thing is, never once talked to me about it. Never once talked to Lisa about it. Just went and talked to other people. But if I have a doubt that I'm working on, frankly, I do not go to you. Would you want me to go to you for that? We've had discussions on Bible and trying to figure things out. But, you know, sometimes there are things like Wednesday night's Bible study. You know, I don't know. You probably don't even remember it. It's not something you're going to dwell on. You know, that's something I'm going to think about for a long time. You know, trying to figure out certain things. It's just because I'm trying, you know, so I'm not going to talk about those things when we're having doubts on others. When Saul and Jonathan died, David said this, tell it not in Gath. Saul tried to kill David. He said, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Just because something happens doesn't mean it needs to be talked about. The thing is, what's in, who, what's in your audience? Who's in your audience? Clyde, pull up that, uh, the white slide, if you would. And I know you can't see this. I can email this to anybody. Here is a graph I made of end times that really just puts everything in place. You, you see that? You, now, understand, you probably look at it and think, man, that's complicated. To me, this it simplifies so much. And, uh, and but, but you look at that. You know, people then misquote Scripture and then misuse it. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Read Matthew 24 in the light of this. And end times, it, you know, because people talk about the gleanings. You know, uh, uh, thrust in thy sickle, for the earth is ripe, is not talking about the rapture. It's talking about, see there off to the right side where it says gleanings? It's talking about that. But, you know, we get this thing, that, you know, well, I don't know what the Bible says about the rapture. Well, I got news for you. There's at least six raptures in the Bible. At least six. But now let's go ahead and just bring this down. Who was the first one? Enoch. Elijah. Jesus, if we want to say the ascension, this is a rapture. No, we're just talking about being snatched up. Right? And so then you have the rapture. But then you have the gleanings. You have the two witnesses at the end of the tribulation. And these guys are being brought up. And so people read, oh, well, and, so, and then we're getting, see, I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Because the initial scripture that I read was designed a little bit to get you thinking in the wrong direction. Not that we misused it, but I'm just going to show you something. But you see Matthew 24 and 25, that block that goes across the gray right there? Because what we do is we read Matthew 24 and 25, and we think it applies to now. That would, If you've done the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me, enter into the kingdom of heaven. And people think, well, if I feed people, clothe people, go visit them in prison, therefore I'm going to heaven. The Bible says it. That's not what it's talking about. But if you believe, you know, if you're struggling with the word salvation and you read that, well, have I gone to the hospital enough? Have I gone, have I fed enough people? Works and salvation doesn't depend on you. Ever. There's no number of people you can visit in order to go to heaven. There's no number of, of uh, hungry people you can feed to go to heaven. It's never going to work. That's top. Just real quick, that Matthew 24 and 25, Matthew 25 is talking about, is talking about the, the nations that take in Israel during the tribulation. It's in context. The ten virgins, which we're going to get to in our, in our Bible study, Matthew 24 and 25, when, when we get there, it's going to take a while. It's talking, you know, the ten virgins, who are they? Well, they're the saved and unsaved. No, the ten virgins are neither. 
If you're part of a wedding party, do you, well, first off, do you think Jesus endorses a man marrying 10 women? No. <laughs> Let's go ahead and just say, no. <laughs> Those 10 virgins that are at the door of the wedding aren't the bride. The bride is in with the groom. These 10 virgins are attendants. What, and you try to put the church into that and you get thrown off. Not understanding what Matthew 24 and 25 is talking about. And then you get hung up on a work salvation. By the way, we might have some rough times. By the way, more of that in point four. Number three, you ready? You're gonna think one and two go to one and three go to better, go to better, go together better, and two and four does. I'm doing this on purpose. But number three, don't overreact. Tipping a thousand dollars because you think the rapture is gonna hit is overreacting. Let's just go ahead and throw that out there. But here, go in asking. If you have a problem with something, go ask. Ask a question first. Remember, we did a whole sermon on this. Go in asking. You don't want to accuse you. Go in asking. And why don't we ask questions of those that we disagree with? Don't overreact, but do act. See, what we do is we panic. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 here. The hunting tactics of a lion right here. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking, seeking whom he may, may devour. A lion doesn't roar when he's hunting. You know this, right? Watch the Discovery Channel. You know, this, you know, these, you know, they're, they're crouched down, they're silent. But what they will do is they, the older lions can roar. And what they'll do is their whole goal is to be on the other side somewhere, roar, startle the wildlife, and then they run in the direction of the, of the animals that can really kill them. Panic. And so what we do is panic. We overreact. Don't do that. But do act. Number four. Man, we're really scooting through these points, aren't we? Number four, and I want you to catch this. Don't let fear drive your doctrine. It's kind of like the old thing. Don't let your pocketbook de decide your doctrine either. You know, we look at our we look at our wallet. I don't even carry a wallet anymore. It's, it's kind of cool. I just have my debit card, my license, and my uh, C CCW permit inside my phone. It's pretty cool. And uh, so, yeah. But anyways, but see, based on point number two, which was what was point number two? Peace comes from knowing the truth. I don't hold the pre-trib pre uh, position because I'm scared of the tribulation. And I think a lot of people get that. They, well, you're just scared of the tribulation. No, I just really understand. I think I understand that, uh, that the tribulation is about Israel. It's not about me. It's Daniel's 70th week. And you look at the beginning of that chapter uh, when it talks about the, the, you know, the angel said to Daniel, the 70 weeks pertain to you and your people. I'm not an Israelite. The, pre, the rapture, does, but just because I believe in pre-trib rapture doesn't mean the church won't go through tribulation. And I think that's what I think, you know, because I tried to read a book on that would try to debunk our position. And somebody, I said, to, you need to read this book. And I read the book. I bought it. Went on, uh, and, or no, went on eBay because I didn't want you know somebody to get my money. Uh, that you know, so you get it used. Man, I just read that with a blue pen. I'm like, you know, just, it was just the whole thing was just silliness. And what it was, it was using a bunch of tactics like, well, they're just scared to go into the tribulation. You know, we are an unprecedented time of peace right now. The church, we're just meeting out here. We have freedom. Nobody's bothering us. You know, and then all of a sudden, somebody tried to kick us out of the building 14 years ago. Ah, oh, we're facing tribulation. You know, the Satan, Satan's after us. <laughs> yeah. No, somebody complained and a code was violated. We fixed it. You know, we're really, that really is a persecution. I think saints from time past would probably, probably laugh at us a little bit. But don't let fear drive your doctrine. If God has us going through the tribulation, we're going through it no matter what I believe. Just give it a few lines here. Now remember, it doesn't mean we, should, we won't face tribulation, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't be prepared. I've said that many times. I'm not pre-trip rapture because it's an escapism. I'm not a Christian because I get to escape hell. I'm a Christian because I love the Lord. Man, going to heaven, that's pretty cool. Jesus died for me, rose again on the third day. Man, that's awesome. 
I'm not pre-trib because I'm scared of the tri tribulation. It shouldn't worry you either. But even if you had to. But you know, we can face tribulation without going through tribulation. Things can turn on and dime for us. And all of a sudden they have squads out there shutting churches down, all sorts of mean stuff. And I'm not saying it's going to happen. But it could. And are we going to say, oh, what's going on? Well, yeah. The church has faced persecution from day one. Our founder faced persecution, so therefore we will as well. And so then we need to be prepared. Need to be prepared. You know, stocked up on food. <laughs> and we say, well, man, I can barely get... Do you know stocking up on food is as simple as buying an extra can of canned food every week? You got all this other stuff you're going to eat? Well, I can't afford that. Well, can you, you know, spare a little bit for you know extra can of food? And then after a few weeks, man, I've got some things packed over here. I've got, And then you start building up a cabinet full of stuff like this. A way to filter water and some canned food, and you're on your way. It's not that hard. But here's the thing, and I hope this isn't a shock to you. We're all going to die. Is this the first you've heard that? So if it's for the cause of Christ, that's pretty cool. It's a high honor. You know, nobody's looking for it. But if it does happen, that's pretty cool. You see what Jesus said up there, what the writer of Hebrews said about the people who, who the Old Testament saints who died and were persecuted. And it, it you know, said, the world, said the world is not worthy of them being on it. So again, don't let fear drive your doctrine, but you know, we do need to prepare. Then number five, last point of the morning. <clears throat> and this is what I think, I don't think anybody here does this. Don't say things that aren't true in order to get a reaction. Don't say things that aren't true in order to get a reaction. <clears throat> As we... We've been through a couple of crises. I should, yeah, I guess, we crises. What's the plural of crisis? Crises. In the last four years, you know, uh, we had the ice storm uh, this last uh, couple months ago. Can you believe? In a couple weeks is giving May. This this year is nearly half over. It's more than a third over. Crazy. But you know, we had fires last summer. We had all those fires in 2020. You know, all the riots that was going on that were going on, Eugene. How much misinformation did you get? A lot. And you learn in those times who you can and who you can't trust. Because if you spread misinformation at any point, I just kind of know I'm not going to listen to you in the future. Right? You know, it blew over Baltimore and said, oh man, the experimental forest is gone. Y'all know where the experimental forest is off Blue River? You turn right and go down there. And so Lisa and I, the other day, you know, we're just, we, this week was nice. We only had to come into town once. Well, twice you count soul winning them. And then three times you count church. See, for me, it's a good, if I only have to come into town three times, it's still only once. You know, it was Wednesday night for church. And we're sitting there, I'm like, you know what we haven't done yet? We haven't gone to so, go see where the experimental forest used to be. Jump in the Corolla, jump and drive the back roads. I barely found a bird spot. Oh, the thing, it's gone. It was all there. I don't know where all the smoke came from. I, uh, but it's misinformation. And so, should we, and here's the question for us, should we lie to get salvations? Does the end justify the means? Well, I lied to him, but now he's saved. Jesus is coming back during this eclipse. Get saved. And then he does it. And now you just create somebody who's going to heaven but thinks you're a liar and thinks, thinks Jesus is bunk. Thinks the Bible's a lie because you said something that isn't true. Do y'all remember Jack Van Envy? Has a TV show. Everything was sensationalized. And something that I probably reacted on the other side. Because when I teach Revelation, there's not one thing that's sensationalized. I point it out and say this is what... But, and it could be the things that happened. It could be that that whatever drone attack, whatever happened the last couple weeks, it could be that that's fulfilling scripture. But you know what? Then all of a sudden, here we are 20 years later, and I claim 20 years ago that it's fulfilling scripture. I, I just have a problem with that. But that's what Jack Van Empty did in every episode. Oh, this is talking about Revelation chapter 18. Well, we wouldn't be talking about Revelation 18. That would be the second battle one. This is talking about Revelation chapter 15. This is, you know, they already talking about this is the bear versus the leopard. Gog, Magog. And, and you're like, wow. 
You know, I was like, man, we, we've got to get it ready. This is the end. And it wasn't. It wasn't. Harold Camping. <laughs> Finally, I find a name that we all can agree on. Harold Camping. Well, the rapture is going to be this October. Do y'all remember the panic in December of 2012? You know, it's the end of the age. That's when the Mayan calendar ends. Even I'm sitting there, man. I just remember that night sitting in my car, you know, listening to some radio program. Lisa's in Walmart. I was just listening to him like, man, this would be pretty cool if the Mayans predicted the return of Christ. I'm sorry. I, I, I think life's cool. I hope you don't get the wrong idea about this. Like when I say something and Matt says, oh, life's cool. I'm not looking to be on the next bus. But you know what? It's like I told the Lord in the last couple of days. Man, it's just been cool if he came back now. I look forward to being with him. You know? But it's not, not an escapism. It's just, you know, hey, Lord, be cool. Go back, you know. Look forward to seeing you. But then I'm thinking, well, that, now I'm not, maybe in order to, make that, to fulfill that prayer, he's going to kill me sooner, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but if that, hey, you know I struggle with, there's my struggle. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is. But you know, sometimes I'm like, well, if I pray for this, but it's against God's will, but I don't want to have it, but then pray for it. But he said, if it's prayed in faith, then I'll answer. Well, I'll take the no if it's not. Uh. Harold Camping. About the fifth time, well, the rapture's going to happen on this day. Well, the fourth time he said, well, it was spiritual. It did happen. But then the last time he called for the physical, and he's, you know, finally, he's off the radio. Finally, he's like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't be saying this stuff anymore. I, I was shocked that he finally, he's like, you yeah, know, apparently I got something wrong. And then he died off. But entire religions are started because of predictions of time of rapture. And I just say this, don't be an idiot. And I wish Kathy was here so I could ask if I could call everybody idiots. Ron, are you okay with it? Yeah. Okay. Ron's okay if I call people it, but he would be okay with just about any. We'd be calling just about anything, right? <clears throat> Don't be an idiot. When you give a salvation testimony, you're going to disagree with me on this, and I don't care. But you've never had to preach a sermon after somebody did it. Don't imply that God healed you as a part of the salvation testimony. walk up to somebody, man, you're not going to believe what God did for me. Now you should get saved. Oh, am I get saved and all of a sudden I'm going to get healed? Now they get saved, but all of a sudden three months later, I'm sick. I'm dying. Don't do that. The, the gospel message, now I'm getting ahead of myself again. The gospel message is compelling enough without my life being thrown into the mix. Jesus Christ died for you. You're a sinner. You deserve punishment for that. But you know what? He loves you. So he died in your place, died in your place, rose again on the third day. Which, by the way, I got healed after I got saved. You're like, wait, wait, how does this fit in? Are you saying that I'm gonna get healed? Don't imply that somebody that you're gonna get rich because you get saved. But I hear people doing it. God's gonna bless you. Well, yeah, that's true. But Jesus never promised us an easy time. Or how about we tell him this? God won't give you more than you can handle. Raise your hand if God's never given you more than you can handle. I just said that backwards, but that's correct. Because I know I'm not going to ask for a hand raising. If God's ever given you more than you can handle, raise your hand, every hand will go up eventually. But, you know, the thing is, God, even if God did give us more than we can handle, let's say that was a Bible promise, we heap stuff on top of it, right? We're there with a shovel just piling it on. I give myself more than I can handle. I don't need God to give me more than I can handle. However, that Bible, that promise is never in the Bible. No, God will never give you more than you can handle. Then you get saved, and about three weeks later, wait, I've got more than I can handle. <laughs> Well, that's when you're supposed to be trusting God. But you said that God won't give me any more than I can handle. <laughs> well, Pastor, it's in Corinthians. No. Corinthians says, what does Corinthians say? It's going to be off the top of my head here. You're not allowed to be tempted above your able. Tempted. 
but will with the temptation provide you a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I think. Is that right? All right, good. You can go ahead and look that up. That does not say God's not giving you a word to handle. As a matter of fact, he gives me a way of escape when he does. And that, but we don't like that escape. <laughs> Let's finish with some Bible, shall we? Let's go back to our text. Go ahead and bring up our uh, text back here. Let's go ahead and read this. I just want to give you an example. Now, that graph that I showed you earlier about end times, I'd be glad to sit down and chit-chat with anybody about that anytime. I'd love to. I would love it. But you know what? Most people don't care to be that in depth with it. I'm okay with that. Verse 36, Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of the heaven, but my Father only. Now you understand when Jesus came to earth, he, earth, he gave up his omniscience. The, the, I've taught that before, and people are shocked by that. Jesus on earth was not all knowing. He gave that up on purpose because he wasn't also omnipresent, was he? He was in Israel. When he was in Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem. When he was in Bethlehem, he was in Bethlehem. Now, God the Father and the Holy Spirit at the same time did not give up their omnipresence. Jesus Christ did. So, the question here is, does Jesus now know the day and the hour? Yeah. Now, the angels in heaven, I don't know. Did they tell them? Who knows? But so now, the only people that we know for sure know is the Father, and then we would assume the Holy Spirit and the Son. So does Harold Camping know? No. Does the person who comes on TV and tells you, well, this is when the Lord's coming back, does he know? I, I, I do need that back up there, if you don't mind. All right, now watch this. And this is the verse we get kind of goofy. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Leave it there if you would. So what, do, what people do is they read this, and they hear some news story. Ah, it's just like the days of Noah. Have you ever heard that? You know, this world's getting crazy. It's like the days of Noah. Is that what Jesus is teaching here? Nope. Because the world's been crazy for a long time. Let's go to verse 38. So what were the days of Noah? For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Are you eating and drinking? Yeah, I think you all did that today. You're probably going to go do it at lunch. You're going back to life. Marrying and giving in marriage. Most of us have done that. One of those two. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So when Jesus says it's as the days of Noah, he's not talking about abortion. He's not talking about homosexuality. He's not talking about any of these other things that we like to lump in as the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking. They were going about their lives. They were marrying. They were enjoying their lives. Just going about it. And all of a sudden, what? And knew not until the flood came. So this guy's getting married, right? And all of a sudden, man, here comes this huge wall of water. Actually, it wouldn't be a wall of water. That's probably, it started raining at first, you know, a little drop. And you're like, what is this, right? Remember, there was no rain before the flood. So all of a sudden, you're wetting, and all of a sudden, it starts raining. You're like, this is goofy. Because you wouldn't have a gazebo. What are you protecting yourself from? There's never been rain before. Why am I in a tent? <laughs> the sun also wasn't beating down as much as it does now, but that's another point. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So he said, man, things are just wicked out there. We're in the days of Noah. No, we're not. It's always been the days of Noah. You know, now that we have social media, now you know about it. Funny thing is, move out of town and stop watching news. It's funny how all of a sudden those thoughts kind of start going away. Now, before you get mad at me on that, remember, I'm praying for them. And knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you know the rapture has two sons? We're, well, there has to be a third temple. No, there doesn't. Absolutely does not have to be a third temple before the rapture. There has to be a temple in the midst of the tribulation, but it doesn't have to be built beforehand. You know, Jesus is just waiting for the, you know, get them to build that temple. You know, and when they build that temple, I can finally come back. What's taking them so long? Oh, Jerusalem won't give them a permit. Oh. <laughs> Does that sound ridiculous? Yeah. And see, that's why people get mad 
that shape. You know what? Just <sighs> and took them away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now watch this in verse forty. Then shall two be in the field, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. There's one, one aspect of the rapture. Which, by the way, if we also read all those passages, one shall be in the field and the other taken. One will be in bed and the other one will be taken. Well, that implies also that Jesus is telling us about time zones. He's telling us that the earth is round back there in Matthew chapter 24. Anyway, you can go ahead and go black screen there. Christianity is pretty cool without sensationalizing it. Jesus Christ's love and the story of the gospel should be compelling enough without embellishing the story. Do you know if there's an eclipse on the planet every 18 months? But we only know about them when they go over, you know, some of them go across the ocean. Nobody knows about them. There's an eclipse season. Do you know that? It's only in spring for the northern hemisphere. It's only in spring because of the way the moon's lined up. There's only two times it can happen. Because of the elliptical orbit of the moon around the Earth, and then it has to be lined up just right, and uh, you know it's a pretty big sky, and a pretty big. You know, it ha but it happens twice, or I say once every eighteen months, maybe twice every eighteen months. But some of them are small, some of them are in the ocean. Nobody cares. But when it goes over the United States, oh bless God, this is these are here end times. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that after an eclipse, it's a new moon that night? It's a sign. <laughs> I had to explain somebody explain that to somebody. I said, Joe, eclipses only happen in new moons. <laughs> They're like, what? Really? Yes. Let me explain this. Sun, moon, earth, new moon. <laughs> Sun, earth, moon, full moon. Oh. <laughs> That's why lunar eclipses only happen on full moons. You don't have a lunar eclipse on Gibeons. I think that's how you pronounce it, right? Gibeus. Waning crescents. But Christianity is pretty cool without the sensationalizing. We just don't need it. Take a deep breath, calm down, stick to Jesus, stick to the Bible. And you know what? We're going to be okay. Father, again, we're thankful for our time on a Sunday morning. It's sure good to see you here this morning. I hope the sermon, even with the sarcasm, was helpful for you. Just take a deep breath. You're going to turn on the news. You're going to see some stupid thing. You know, here I am trying to struggle. I'm paying taxes. And now we're paying $6 billion in foreign aid to one side to help in their war, even though we're also going to pay $6 billion, you know, to somebody else help on their side. You've seen the meme. It's rockets going this way with, say, our tax dollars, and then rockets going back this way, surprisingly also our tax dollars. You all remember that we sent billions of dollars of cash to Iran, right? You all remember this. But because Obama did it, nobody talked about it. But then all of a sudden now, we're, you know, there's aid going everywhere. We're funding everybody's wars. If they can print money, why am I still paying taxes? Now you got me on another rant. Because <laughs> you know, some people have low enough income to where you don't pay any tax, right? Wrong. Your cell phone, your rent, your utilities. You pay a lot of taxes. Anyways, now with all that ranting I've carried over, I love y'all very much. Thank you. What? Everyone just calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take care of that. Alright. Everybody turn to Proverbs. It says here. It says here. A drippy roof and a contentious wife are the same. I do pray for you. You know that right here. Drip. 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 All right. I'll try to calm down. Come back in two weeks to find out if it works. I love you all very much. You're just Congratulations. You've endured to the end. You made it to the end of the sermon, and I'm proud of you. Hey, my number's at the bottom of the screen here. Text me if you need anything. I hope to see you here sometime. Have a great day.